So thank you, everybody. First thing we're going to do is Orrin is going to speak to the land beneath our feet. Hi, folks. Um, yes, first, uh, a land acknowledgement. The Owaswas, to the Owaswas speaking Yupi tribe, and particularly to the Amamutsun tribal band, the UCSC Farm and Garden and the entire university occupy and operate on the unceded territorial lands of the Amamutsun tribal band. This land was wrongly taken from them, and they in turn were taken from this land, their land, to the missions at Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista. And now as the Amamutsun continue to reclaim their sovereignty and relearn their traditional ecological knowledge that sustained this landscape and its natural resources, we support them and we hope that you will too. And so it is with respect to them and to the earth itself that we farm this land at the farm and garden for the people, all peoples, over all time. Now I'm supposed to talk about me. I'm Orrin Martin. I've been working up here at the farm, farm and garden, UCSC Farm and Garden. Well, since I don't know when, I began volunteering in 1971, but I've been in my present position as manager of the Allen Chadwick Garden, but I also help out at the farm particularly in the orchard, since 1977. It'll be 44 years come this July the 11th. That's 7 11 77. I guess it was a lucky day. Uh, I'm involved in uh, maintaining the garden, help maintaining the orchard at the farm. Uh, I am involved in instruction to a diversity of audiences. Uh, we had formally and will have again a robust set of public workshops. Uh, and I teach many of those. Uh, I teach uh, undergraduates both in class uh, situations and in uh, uh, in garden, in, in field and garden uh, internship uh, uh, situation. Uh, we take volunteers and uh, as we are now informally open at the farm and garden, we're accepting volunteers, get a hold of us. Uh, but our you know, flagship program is uh, I teach in along with other uh, staff is an apprentice program. Program. Uh, we've uh, had probably in excess of 1,600 apprentices who have come and lived residentially and learned the rudiments of farming and gardening. Uh, and that's essentially what I do. And I want to point out that Oren's wife did this beautiful piece of artwork. Yes, and I want to point out and as, <laughs> that's a hooded Oreo looking at those luscious mandarins. We it, thought it was you. This is in Talio uh, copper plate etching. It's a really uh, detailed uh, style of uh, presentation is really torturous for the artists. But as you can see, there are uh, really nice results. So um, go ahead. Do you want to talk? I, I, I missed a slide here. I want to just say a few things about Zoom and the Zoom housekeeping. Go ahead. Yeah. Tonight, um, we have a few items. You're muted. You might notice that your video has been turned off. That's because of the bandwidth. We want to make sure everybody can see and, and there's no stuttering of the technology. Um, we will answer questions as best we can through the chat. So as the, as the presentation goes on, you can put your questions in the chat um, and they will be saved to the end and we will feed those back to Oren. Now, a couple of people have sent them by email in advance, so we have those recorded and we'll ask those. There's a little button on, um, on your control panel in Zoom. It's called live transcript. So if you wanna see what's being said as well as hear it, you can, you can click that button and um, you will get closed captioning. The session is being recorded and we'll send a link to the recorded version along with the presentation and anything that um, we have as a resource or a handout um, uh, a few days after the workshop. So if you miss something or you come in late, just don't worry about it. It's um, gonna be sent to you and you can go over it again. And if you have any issues um, with the technology, please chat directly with Vanessa, who is our Zoom hostess tonight. All right, Warren, tell them all about the friends. Okay, as I mentioned, this talk and all of our public workshops are brought to you by our affiliates group, the UCSC Friends of the Farm and Garden. And they are true friends in so many respects. Um, and uh, I would like to encourage you to become a member. Uh, 
there are a number of benefits uh, as a result. As you can see on the screen here, there are discounts at local nurseries. Um, there's early entry to our annual plant sale. Um, and um, I might note that the logo uh, in the right hand of this uh, right hand side of this uh, screen here is done by a friend, uh, Tom Killian, a noticed uh, artist. Uh, he did this for us, so it's sweet of him. Um, so uh, we also have a news and notes publication. This is called a quarterly newsletter, that's chock full of uh, relevant information and usually some uh, pretty in depth horticultural uh, articles. Uh, so there's a few reasons there that you might want to join the Friends of the Farm and Garden, but I think in the end, the principal reason for joining this support group is to support the work that we do at the UCSC Farm and Garden in teaching the rudiments of organic farming and gardening. We're training the next generation and soon the one after that, so join. Here's a little rundown of what we hope to get through here today. Uh, and uh, maybe we could just dive in. I actually wanna read something else before we begin. Uh, been a rough and bumpy ride this pandemic, eh? Uh, no need to answer my rhetorical question there. Um, early on uh, last summer, uh, Mike Ryan, a wonderful man, an actor and the head of uh, Shakespeare, Santa Cruz Shakespeare as it's now called, uh, sent this out and I uh, copied it and I put it on the garden gate at Chadwick. Uh, and you know, and got kind of worn out by the weather and all that. Uh, but just recently, as I said, we are now informally open at the farming garden. The locks are gone. You can come on in and come up and visit. And I thought, well, I'd repost this. Uh, and uh, so I want to reread it to you. So this is from Mike Ryan of Santa Cruz Shakespeare. Read the various stages of this pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, These moments of isolation lead to profound changes. However, a renewed sense of self, a regeneration of purpose, and a deeper understanding about why it is good to love one another. As the exiled Duke Senor says in Shakespeare's As You Like It, and this our life exempt from public haunt finds tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. It's as if Shakespeare whispers in our ear that we will be better for this time of isolation, that there will come an end to exile, and that in exchange for our losses, the world to which we return will be better than the one we left behind. And me, I can't wait to see you in this brave new world. So come on up to the farm and garden, folks. Okay. <laughs> Uh, today's topic is, uh, it seems like we've um, channeled uh, uh, weather from the origins of citrus, the tropics. It's 94 on my in the shade on my front doorstep five minutes ago, a little hot for Santa Cruz. Uh, uh, but today the topic is citrus, and citrus is the, the, definitely the uh, prominent genus in the Rutaceae family, the Rue family. Um, now, this is a small family, but it has huge economic and nutritional significance, obviously, uh, with citrus. So uh, citrus and fortunella, which is a slightly allied uh, genus, slightly different, slightly allied uh, genus uh, containing kumquats and their hybrids. And uh, I'll bring it up later, but I would, uh, you can grow, uh, well, let me just, a uh, little disclaimer here. Everything I'm saying about citrus is generally true far as I know. Uh, but most specifically, what I'm saying about citrus applies to central coastal California, down the, on, on West Cliffs, the salt spray zone, coastal strand, all the way up to the uh, top of the marine terraces, a thousand feet, generally applies here. So, uh, so the genus citrus and the genus fortunella. Uh, genus uh, uh, fortunella contains kumquats and its hybrids. And I say that because uh, there was already a, a, a email that came in. Someone was asking about their lime tree. It said it had grape, grape, not grapefruit, but grape-sized fruit on it and sickly and losing its leaves. And that's the deal. You can't grow true limes in Santa Cruz, but you can grow lime quads, which are just about as good. And uh, we'll get to that later here. Um, so these two genera are, of course, uh, nutritional bonanzas, um, and they uh, are 
that there's a huge economic industry worldwide around citrus, and that's great. Uh, but there are other genera. Most members of this family have really strong oil glands, and in most cases, uh, they give us pleasant uh, scents, aromas, and such. Uh, not all. Um, and uh, so some ornamentals in this family would be uh, something called acoria. It's a, there are many species from ground covers up to four or five foot tall shrubs. Um, and they have these beautiful pendant multicolored uh, flowers. I, like almost all members of this family, they, have, they feature really waxy leaves, waxy flowers and uh, a nice wax cuticle on the fruit. Um, this is good to help citrus uh, uh, maintain while it's on the tree. Uh, another member of this family is the white zapote, Casamaroa edulis, uh, a subtropical that actually will grow and fruit in Santa Cruz. We have a couple down at the farm and they're not as good as they are in the true tropics, but they're pretty darn good. Um, and uh, let me just say, uh, it's a really rangy, tall, 30, 35 foot tree, uh, but the fruit drops when it's ripe, so just pick it up. Um, and Ruta, which gives us the bait, the gen genus that Ru is in, Ruta, which gives us the base name of the family. Um, A-C-E-A-C-E-A-E -A -C -E -A -E simply means family in Latin. So they usually attach an important or a large genus as the base of the family name in this case. I don't know why they didn't call it citrus aceae. That's you know, more significant than rue. Uh, rue is a bitter herb. It's a really astringent herb, a really beautiful plant. Um, and uh, in fact, you have to be careful when you're working with it. it. It can give you a mild or even moderate dermatitis like that. And it was, it's, been, it's dubbed in herbals and such the herb of grace. And I never could figure out why such a stanky thing would be called the herb of grace. But then um, someone who was an apprentice a number of years ago was a literature major and so she knew these things. Um, and she said that in uh, medieval times, they used to take sprigs of rue and uh, pepper the corpse before they uh, had the ceremony and, and, and closed the corpse up to keep the flies away to keep the body from being from rotting. And having worked on a biodynamic goat farm for about five years when I was younger, uh, uh, we used to hang sprigs of rue, sprigs of tansy, sprigs of yarrow in the milking room, and they did a fairly good job of keeping the flies away. Um, but it, like I said, it can induce, uh, be careful when you're working with it, uh, lovely plant, uh, strong odors, but it can induce a, a, a milder worse uh, dermatitis. Uh, Choicea is called mock orange and there are a number of species. And uh, uh, this whole family ba basically features flowering in what for us the off season, fall, winter into early spring. And Choicea sits right there in that uh, time bracket. Um, mock orange and it's, it's scented as citrus and it's a beautiful pristine white waxy flower. Uh, really nice shrub, maybe four or five feet by four or five of easy culture. Uh, and then the last one here in terms of prominent genera in this family is Ponsiris, um, which is uh, uh, also called the trifoliate orange because it has three-parted leaves, trifoliate. Um, and it has an ornamental form as you see in the upper left here, uh, which is often referred to as the flying dragon. And it is a wild looking thing. Um, really thorny, small bitter fruits, uh, and it's deciduous. And uh, part of the reason it, it, it's, it's used as a rootstock is because it imparts a little more cold hardiness to citrus. Uh, it's from Northern uh, China somewhere. Um, uh, but it also imparts dwarfing or semi-dwarfing to rootstock. So it's the principle of semi-dwarfing rootstock. Okay, we can move on now, please. Um, think of all the citrus you can think of. Think of all the citrus you see in season in the stores. Think of all the citrus you see for sale in the nurseries. And it's almost like option paralysis. And it's just a, quite an array of citrus available to us uh, through various sources uh, to grow and or to buy. Uh, but they all come from three common parents, the mandarin, familiar with, the pomelo and the citron. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about them as we go here. Um, and they think that citrus originated uh, almost as old as the hills, seven, eight million years ago in the foothills of the Himalayas. When I say it's as old as the hills, I've always, that, that, that phrase, it's, hey, that's as old as the hills. Um, I've always thought of it as, have, I have no idea, 
but I've always thought of it as having geological roots. Uh, mountains, when they're first formed uh, as a result of vol uh, volcanoes, volcanism, uh, tectonic plates smashing each other, causing jagged peaks like the Him Himalayas, the Andes, and the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and then over time, they're worn down, ground down into rounded hills. Uh, so citrus, it's as old as the hills. There's recently, in the last 10 years, they found evidence of leaves of citrus in Yunnan, uh, province of China, and I think that's that's when citrus started. Now, mind you, when citrus started, it wasn't quite what we have today when you think of a, a navel orange or a, a cutie uh, mandarin. They were small, hard, and bitter fruits. But the genes of citrus is such that uh, they intermingle, they cross-pollinate, they hybrid, hybridize naturally, and they've done this for seven, eight million years on their own. And they've done this for a number of years under the tutelage of human beings and conscious breeding programs. Uh, and uh, so that happened. And then citrus started to migrate. Uh, and it basically migrated naturally south and southeast for an area bounded by Assam in Northeast India, uh, uh, Myanmar, which is in the news for wrong reasons these days, and the Yunnan province of China, down into uh, Southeast Asia, Southern China, India, uh, Laos, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, uh, the Malaysian archipelago, Australia, and the Philippines. Um, and uh, in each of those area, geographic areas, uh, new species naturalized, mm -hmm. hybridized and naturalized. Uh, Okay, we can move on a little bit. Uh, this is what I just said here, but let's stop here and look at the pretty picture. It's always a good thing to do. Uh, on the left, the Kalamandan or the Kalamansi, as it's sometimes called in the Philippines, um, is, uh, boy, right now it's kind of ranking at the top of my chart for my favorite citrus. And we have a few still on the few trees that we have at the garden, but we've been eating them since January. Uh, they're small. Uh, round, as you can see. Uh, they actually get a, a, a nice kind of uh, vibrant orange. I don't know uh, why they chose to pick, take a picture of these with green skins here. And they are uh, acidic, but they have a little sweetness too. My favorite use is to simply squeeze them in a glass of ice fizzy water at the end of the day, it's a good drink, uh, but it also makes an excellent marmalade. And if you choose to use blood orange with it, so much the better. On the right lower is a really cool rare thing that, um, that I've had a couple of times and I finally planted a tree of it last year. The Australian finger lime, AKA citrus caviar because you can see the little pearl-like uh, beads inside the fruit. And you cut it long, it's an oblong thing, maybe three, four inches long. It, it, it is green at maturity. Um, and you cut it, have it, and you just scoop out the uh, caviar-like uh, uh, centers and it's a, again it's kind of a sweet uh, tart treat okay next um okay so citrus is from the lowlands of the tropics that's his hearth and home center of origin as Vavilov coined it um and yet not much citrus worldwide is produced in tropical regions not none but not much and and there's a reason for that um, in the tropics, with its constant heat and humidity, very little day, le day length variation, season to season, very little temperature var uh, variation. It's pretty darn ambient in that sense. Uh, it's the same day in and day out, uh, night and day. Um, well, under those conditions, citrus tends to carry, it's constantly flowering, setting fruit, maturing fruit. And consequently, it'll carry two, three, even four crops simultaneously. Under those conditions with very little variation in temperature and day length, uh, it doesn't color. Additionally, it doesn't hold on the tree well. So you can't tell what's ripe and what's not. It's a bit of a crapshoot, underripe, overripe, or just right. Um, so it's not a really, uh, I mean, the, the, the fruit when sweet is amazing. Uh, and, but it just doesn't lend itself to productions. So production is production areas of the world are mostly subtropical and Mediterranean climates. Um, and under those conditions where you have 
alternation day and night in terms of temperature, alternation seasonally in terms of temperature, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a varying day lengths, winter and summer. Citrus colors, and that's an important feature in terms of knowing when it's ripe and also in selling it. Uh, now, there's some slight differences, and we have here on the right California exemplifying a Mediterranean climate uh, and Florida exemplifying a subtropical climate. Let's just kind of look at that a little bit. Citrus in those two differing climates will be different. Uh, let's, uh, and this is not regional chauvinism, this is driven by the climate and biology. Um, uh, because if you, you know, uh, there's a, always a war going on between Florida growers and, and California ar growers. Ours is better, ours is better than yours. They're both great, they're different. Um, in Florida, which is a, li a little more tropical, uh, where there is, yes, some temperature variation day and night and season to season and some variation in, in day length, winter and summer, but not a lot, citrus tends to be large and lumpy. And I don't mean that in a pejorative manner. It's, it's, it's amazing. And they are veritable juice bombs. They don't really segment that well. And they're actually kind of hard to peel, uh, but they have a, a sugar content that's off the charts and they uh, uh, just make great juice. And so that's what Florida does with its oranges. They, they, they fuel the juice industry like that. Um, so you come out to California or any of the other Mediterranean climates, the Mediterranean Basin, Chile, South, tip of South Africa, uh, South and Southwest Australia. In Mediterranean climates, you have even more fluctuations with day and night temperatures in each of the seasons and uh, seasonally. Uh, and uh, you have uh, longer and shorter days, more so than you do that do in, in Florida, uh, summer and winter. And the way citrus responds to this is it's a little smaller. I don't mean it's, it's substandard, it's pr plenty good size, but it's smaller. It's got a really pretty kind of marbled uh, exterior. The color is really high end just, and you can see quite a distinct difference between different varieties and their coloration. Uh, uh, one would be the blood orange, obviously. Oh, look, just so happens. I have a, one of the last blood oranges in the garden here. Another would be, uh, again, last of the season, the tangelo here. It's kind of like brick red color to it. But color, the cosmetics, good. Color is really exquisite. Um, and the sugar acid ratio is more balanced than tropical, i.e. Florida uh, citrus. Uh, and it also easier to peel Mediterranean climate produced uh, oranges and they section well. Consequently, they're used for eating out of hand as the old expression goes and they fuel fresh sales like that. Both are good, but they're different. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, subsequently uh, different varieties that exist thrive in different in these two different climates, the Mediterranean and subtropical, and the breeding efforts in each of these two different uh, areas, University of Florida principally and uh, UC Riverside uh, here, uh, are to breed citrus varieties that do well in their uh, climate. Next. Uh, this is just a little sidebar. Uh, citrus uh, has a lot of oil glands, pleasant ones, good ones, and uh, 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 if you take any citrus and you just roll it, you can roll it in your palms, you can roll it on a table like that, just for, you know, 30 seconds, 90 seconds like that, it, re it, it causes some of the juice sacs in the skin to uh, rupture and release uh, the oils, and that will bleed slightly and quickly and slightly into the meat of the fruit, and it'll really enhance the flavor. So try it, or you can do a comparative. Try the same thing uh, with and without rolling it. Okay, uh, I just want to stop. Uh, 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 first, stop and thank Elise for her support. Thank Vanessa Ackerman for her support. I thank Aaron Foley for her support. I believe they're all in the house, as it were, or in their houses, maybe, um, as it is. Um, uh, but Elise Principal, she's the president of our Friends of the Farming Garden, uh, and she's highly supportive, but she's also just like a powerhouse in a good way. Uh, <laughs> she put these slideshows together for me, who I am digitally 
e illiterate. Um, so this is just there, you know, it's just kind of lead into what we're going to talk about next, but pause. Um, citrus really lends itself uh, to containers and even on Zai uh, level, if you will. And if you were, you know, maybe in another time in Japan or China, and you're going to a very formal dinner, you would walk in and you'd be greeted in a cour courteous manner and you would respond in kind, of course. And you would be handed perhaps a little bonsai pot with a citrus in it with some nice ripe mandarins on it that you took and put on your table and at some point it would be appropriate to eat it. Or you might just be handed an individual fruit. I have here again, I'm going to say this with every fruit I hold, the last of our, the last of our Clementine or Algerian mandarins. This is one of the two varieties that comprises the brand Cuties. This and Mercot, uh, and they're kind of the same, but they you can't really distinguish the difference looks and taste. And what they do is they extend the uh, marketing season by a couple of months like that. But here you would be handed here, welcome, uh, a, a little mandarin with a leaf attached. And it's significant. It, it's in the culture of both China and Japan. It hopes to bestow good luck, perpetual health. And I wish this to you. Okay, we can move on. Thank you, Orrin. Um, so uh, back door citrus, out the back door, down the steps, uh, out into the yard, or oh, stop. You could just stay on the porch or the patio and do it in a container. Uh, citrus, I think, is one of the most doable uh, fruits in a container. A lot of times I get people, I let people talk me into telling them how they can grow deciduous fruit trees in containers, and you kind of can, but you kind of can't do it that well, but not so with citrus, it's excellent. So out the back door, down the steps, into the yard, or just hang on the patio or porch in a container. Uh, citrus just gives you such big, I mean that literally and figuratively, I guess, big yields big dividends from small size manageable trees. The idea of dwarf trees is so much more doable with citrus than it is with deciduous trees. And what does it give us? It yields us the summer stored and transformed sunlight and energy, along of course with bountiful amounts of vitamin C at a time of year, late fall through late spring, we really could use a boost. There's some afternoons in the garden when the shadows are getting long in January or February, and I walk out by the citrus terraces and they're just these glowing orbs. It's just full of vitality. Um, so that's a nice image, but it's totally attainable uh, in your backyard uh, with some simple planning and some good choices about site and varieties and some pretty easy care. And I want to say uh, uh, citrus is not that it has its particulars, but it's not as difficult or demanding as deciduous fruit trees are. Uh, it's much easier to grow. Well, one of the reasons is you don't prune citrus. Not much at all. If you're pruning citrus, you're doing it all wrong. You, you prune it to shape it to get rid of some rid of some wayward branches, as it were, conduct disorders, as they say in the teaching uh, industry. Um, uh, but you don't prune it, and the principal reason is that it bears. It's a terminal bearer, or it bears apically, or on the tips of branches. So when you're pruning, you're pruning off your crop. If you have a need to prune citrus, do it right when the crop comes off the tree so they can grow and recover enough for the next year and cropping like that. But generally, you don't want to prune it. You don't need to prune it. Pruning is by and large, other than a little touch up here and there, deleterious. Uh, but my point is uh, that it's a relatively, it, relatively easy to be successful. Oren, can I ask a question that's been coming up? Sure. People are asking about thinning. Yes. Oh, well, another dividend going citrus. It's self, it's self pollinated, so you can just have one tree. It's fine. You don't need a pollinator tree, and it's self thinning. Wow, how cool is that? Because if you look uh, in the, the the seasonal progression of growth in this area, it is sometime, and it, it could start as early as January. Could be as late as April as it was this year where it was a really cool and prolonged winter spring try though um, but sometime usually around Feb into March you'll get a, a flush of new growth and off that tips of that new growth you'll get flowers and clusters of flowers it's cray cray as it were um, and uh, 
they're extremely scented. Anybody who's been around citrus knows this. It's just the, the, the loft is amazing. There actually is one ornamental citrus that is a, a beyond category in terms of scents, both the size of the flower and the scent that wafts that it wafts out. And this is a thing with a French name. You have to pardon my French. Bouquet de fleurs. It's an ornamental, uh, but again, it, the fruit actually makes a really good marmalade. Anyhow, so uh, Feb into March, you get a flusher growth. At the tip of that new growth, you get flowers, tons of flowers. You get bees. Uh, they come and they pollinate, and you get tons of little nubbin fruit. And then all of a sudden, in May, you may start to freak out. They're dropping on the ground. This is citrus self thinning, self regulates. Wood that deciduous trees. We, we've been been a little late, but we've been thinning our apples and pears. We have a, a burgeoning crop of pears and a pretty darn good crop of apples this year. A good crop of peaches, and yeah, a pretty shy crop on the pluots and plums, with the exception of the flavor grenade and uh, flavor king uh, uh, pluot, uh, which are really good. Um, but uh, uh, thinning. Uh, some commercial growers guesstimate that they use as much as their as 70% of their annual labor budget in two, three short weeks in the spring when they prune, when they thin their fruits. Hey, the citrus, they self thin. Now, uh, that's pretty cool. So, okay, so uh, hopefully that'll be a sufficient answer. Uh, so, uh, uh, what did I say something with uh, uh, a little planning, some good choices. Good choices involve two things in my mind. One is selecting the right varieties. Um, hey folks, we don't live in a tropical climate. Not all citrus is going to do well here. And we'll go over those that do and don't a little later uh, here. But good choices are important with varieties. But good choices are a paramount with your site selection as well. Um, you need to know your spot. And do can you grow citrus there? Uh, you could probably safely grow citrus, particularly on south facing slope up to 1,000, 1,200 feet in this county, Santa Cruz County. Um, but they are uh, 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 damaged and even killed by frost. So you can, and we live in the climate we live in, but there are many microclimates. You may even have a few microclimates on your property. So here's some things to think about in choosing a spot to site your citrus. Um, if you can, and in a minute, I'll, we'll flip to a slide that shows this a little bit, um, but uh, south-facing slopes, particularly high on a south-facing face, slope is gonna be a little warmer my, my, uh, microclimate. Low wind is important. Wind is really tough on plants. The buffeting of a wind will cause them to thicken their cells and not elongate their cells and, and grow. And citrus is really not fond of wind. Now, having said that, uh, a little bit of air mixing and wind you know, on a cold night can help prevent frost, but don't pick a windy spot, particularly at the top of the hill that's exposed for citrus. Um, uh, raised beds. Uh, a raised bed, now these are all tips that can help you with mitigating the danger and damage that can come from frost. Raised beds. If you look at the soil, you have the solid comp component of the soil and you have pore spaces between the solids. The pore spaces are all uh, occupied ultimately by air in water. So to the degree you have a raised or lofted bed and you have good practices and you have good soil structure, you'll have more pore space or air space in your soil. To the degree you can have more air in your soil, air uh, will, more air space in your soil will keep the soil warmer in the winter. So this little thing. Um, Growing, uh, planting against a, a fence or a wall or a building or a house, particularly one that's dark colored is a good strategy. Uh, a building, especially if it has heat, will radiate, a, radiate out heat at night and again, uh, mitigate cold temperatures. Uh, uh, but any dark background surface will absorb more heat in the daytime and then re-radiate it back out at night. And sometimes a difference of a degree or two can make the difference of survival or not for trees, particularly young citrus trees, which are really subject to frost damage. Dark mulch can help similarly. Um, and then, especially when trees are young, I mean, the first two, three years, um, I just uh, cover them with a frost blanket. It can be uh, a, a product called Reme. It's a 
woven polyester woven uh, cover. Uh, sometimes and often at home, we just use tablecloths. Um, ideally, the cover shouldn't touch, but it's okay if it does. Uh, another trick, I've never done it, but others have done it, is use Christmas lights. And you get a little heat boost uh, underneath the uh, canopy of the of the cover, but not the modern LED ones. They don't put out heat uh, like that. Um, and again, you need to be wise with choosing your varieties. We'll look at a, a, a cold hardiness chart in a minute here. Uh, okay, let's move on. So this is about site selection if you have a choice. A lot of times a home gardener, it's the site that the site chooses you. You don't get to choose the site so much. But if you have your uh, a choice, a south facing slope is going to be more amiable, warmer. And if you look at this diagram here, the, the depiction on the left shows up about a, you know, uh, maybe a 10 degree, 20 degree slope like that. Uh, the angle that the sun strikes the ground on south facing slopes in the northern hemisphere uh, uh, makes it so that the light is light and thus heat energy is concentrated. Whereas on, on flat ground or a northern slope, it is dispersed over a wider energy. Uh, the result is you get both, you get both greater air and soil temperatures on slight south facing slopes. So if you have a choice, it can make a difference. Okay. In fact, a uh, personal anecdote, uh, I lived up in the, at, at the aforementioned uh, uh, goat farm I lived on for five years. I milked uh, goats uh, every evening for, uh, actually it was uh, four years and eight months. We never missed a night. Uh, we had 30 uh, salmon goats, which is Beautiful, big, calm goat. It's kind of the cow of goats. Uh, a very placid animal for a goat. Um, anyhow, I lived at the top of the slope. My buddy lived down the hill. Um, and I had citrus, and my citrus, you know, we were at about 11, 1200 feet, but south facing, um, about three miles inland, uh, uh, Bonnie Doom. Uh, and uh, I was able to uh, grow citrus, and he got frosted out. So, so again, you see here uh, the slope, the lay of the land as it's depicted here, top of slopes, as long as it's not too windy, uh, at down to maybe that bench where it says south slope, probably an ideal setting like that. Uh, down in the bottom, the, that, the bottom land is referred to as frost pockets. Cold air is heavy, like water, it seeks its own level, it flows down a hill and settles at the bottom. So think about uh, a microclimate, but also the lay of the land will influence the type of depth, the quality, of the, the inherent quality of the soil that you have. Um, so those beautiful, amiable, warm, south-facing slopes, they don't have the deepest of soils. So you'll have to look and see if it's suitable and you have to improve the soil. The bottom land is, river valleys and such have the richest deepest soils. So um, you just need to kind of put all these pieces in your jigsaw puzzle together and think about where you're going to plant citrus. Let's move on. Uh, yeah, let's look at the cold hardiness chart here. Uh, um, it's sum summarized by saying, not very, but let's go through some of the, uh, on the left here are four uh, uh, upper left, uh, four depictions of something that's alternately called the citron, the etrog, or the Buddha's hand. And they're very similar. The Buddha's hand is the coolest of all. Uh, and it's thought to be a mutation out of the original citron. Citron, again, is one of the original parent uh, citrus. Uh, uh, they're not very hardy. There's damage at, at 32 degrees. Let me just say this too. In terms of frost damage, it generally goes like this. What's the effect? There are a couple of factors. How cold does it get? What's the duration of that cold? Uh, and then as far as damage, it, uh, flowers are damaged first, young fruit, mature fruit, twiggy light wood, and then heavy branch structure. Um, we had a frost, we had two frosts within a week and a half of one another in um, December of 90 and, and December of 91. And it was just, it got down to the single digits in the San Lorenzo Valley. The garden, we were in the mid lower 20s like that. But I, I have to say that the citrus behaved exactly like a citrus cold hardiness chart. <laughs> uh, so moving down the line here, uh, limes, uh, you can't really grow the true lime, the Mexican lime, the bartender's tender's lime, the key lime here in uh, coastal California. Uh, it really needs the heat and the humidity of Florida, the Caribbean, uh, Mexico like that. In fact, if temperatures get much below 55 degrees, uh, a true lime will go dormant. And it'll look like we wish it wasn't 
there. So it's not worth it. Um, move down a little, a little bit uh, here. Uh, and lemons are uh, uh, particularly susceptible to cold. And uh, uh, if we have a really serious frost uh, snap in this county, we will lose plenty of lemons. Uh, so uh, moving down a little further, uh, the grapefruit is, to me, surprisingly more cold hardy than uh, the, uh, the lemon, but uh, it's true. I can attend to that. Pomelo, which is a great fruit. I'm not going to talk about that much, but go to the farmer's market in January, February, and March and buy them. They're like a milder, sweeter, easier to section and peel grapefruit. And they, in fact, they are one of the parents of the, of the grapefruit. Uh, uh, can take mid 20s, 24, 25. Uh, the tangelo, which is, a, I think I held one up here. Oh, here you go. The tangelo is a human cross between a grapefruit and a uh, mandarin. And it's got this cool little nubbin bottleneck at the top here, kind of usually more brick red orange color to it like that. Um, and they're, uh, it was bred in Florida, so they all have names, native peoples. Uh, 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 this is Mineola, which is the sweetest of them all. Uh, another one is uh, uh, Seminole, uh, like that. But Mineola is, is probably the best bet, and it's fairly uh, uh, cold uh, hardy, as you uh, can see here. Uh, oranges uh, and uh, uh, mandarins, even even more hardy. Um, and uh, the well, lemons are particularly cold sensitive. The Meyer lemon, which is a cross, and people aren't really sure if it's natural or human cross between a lemon and a lime, is extremely cold hardy. Some argue even more cold hardy than the the most cold hardy of all is to, is the Fortunella genus, the, the, the kumquat. But uh, Meyer lemons and, and kumquats along with the Kalamondin are about the most cold hardy of all, all of the citrus. Um, and uh, it proves to be true. Uh, so let's move on. Um, I was joking with the least, it's like every darn talk is the same talk. It's always about the soil starts with the soil. And it's true, but I'm not going to belabor that here other than to say, uh, if you're wanting to plant citrus, uh, I'll say a couple things about cover crops and, and soil improvement with citrus. In the run up to planting, it's a good idea in the, uh, in the fall, late summer, fall to sow a cover crop. Grow it, then turn it in in January or February. Let it rot down for until you don't see any more plant material, maybe two, three, four weeks, depends on the soil temperature, and then plant. Um, and uh, when you go to sow that cover crop, apply compost. If you're working on a farm scale, about five, 10 uh, uh, tons to the acre. If you're working on a garden scale, you know, a spadeful per square foot is a pretty liberal dose. Uh, apply it. Work the soil, sow your cover crop, grow your cover crop, chop down your cover crop, turn in your cover crop, let your cover crop rot down, dig a hole, plant a tree. Uh, then when you planted the tree, you top dress it with both compost and fertilizer, just work that into the surface, maybe two, three, four inches like that, and mulch. Uh, uh, you should get a soil test. Uh, citrus, is, uh, citrus is an interesting crop. Once established, it's uh, pretty, good at foraging for nutrients, but in the first one to three years, you really need to push it. So you need to get an assessment of your soil and see if all the macro and micronutrients are, as it were, up to snuff. And again, as I said in previous talks, if you get a soil test, I recommend this lab, a &L lab, and you send me the result, a complete test, and you send me the results, I will make comments, and I will make constructive comments, uh, and tell them what you're growing, and tell them that you're growing organically. Hopefully you are. Okay, we can move on. But the quote at the bottom is, is uh, really true. It's just like, activate biology. Work smart, not hard. Um, now, Buckminster Fuller, the fellow who's mentioned here, who's the accredited with being the designer, the inventor of the geodesic dome, he was just a free thinker. Uh, he didn't invent the geodesic dome, but he uh, uh, pioneered it. Uh, he probably didn't know anything about cover. But I'm sure you would have approved growing. Hey, Oren, while you're talking about soil, is there any any particular soil you recommend for pots? Um, are you, I, I would recommend, I, I would, one, 
we'll go a more into. Can we just save it until we get to the container slide? Yes. Okay, good. Let's do that. Uh, Karen feeding citrus need uh, nutrient needs. They have needs, um, uh, and they're different than deciduous trees. Citrus are evergreen, so they're constantly growing, and they're needing a constant, steady supply of nutrients. It's a typical pattern for applying nutrients to uh, uh, deciduous trees. You go out early as you can in the season, and you put your compost and fertilizer on. Uh, with citrus, citrus is fertilized in a manner um, that are called splits, splits by growers. That is about every four, six to eight weeks. I know that's a quite a variation. Uh, you want to apply something. Um, and uh, there are so many products out there on the market and they're all amazing. Uh, I think I've said this before, but when I go to the garden center these days, I get option paralysis, all this certified organic fertilizers that there are, and it's great. Um, and they have some that are marked you know, for citrus, and that's good. Um, what matters? Uh, what matters is that you apply fertility, and I would have the dual modality of some compost. Notice my lack of specificity there. Depends on the size of the tree and how much compost you have. Uh, but on a small tree, one to three years old, I would put one to three shovelfuls of compost around the drip line. The drip line is the outer circumference of the leaves of the tree, where if rain, remember what Mr. Rain, would fall, it would create a drip line around the outside. Most of the active feeding roots of citrus are somewhat inside that drip line and somewhat outside that drip line. So that's an area you want to be putting your nutrients on. So applying compost and a granular fertilizer, working it into the soil two to four inches, and then watering. Water activates fertilizer, particularly dry fertilizer. Um, and the numbers here are good. Something with greater than 5% nitrogen, 2% P is phosphorus, and K is potassium. Uh, that's good. Uh, and some of the products I'm kind of keen on these days is Gard Gardener and Bloom, and Dr. Earth have recently uh, become certified organic. And they also have give you that boost at their, their granular fertilizers, have mycorrhizal fungi inoculants. So they get a little mycorrhizal fungi live in association with plant roots. They are basically root extenders. They go out and forage for water and nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, bring it up into the core of the root. And it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship there. So both Dr. Earth and Gardner and Bloom have that. Uh, uh, and, and I like uh, Gardner and Bloom citrus uh, fruit tree fertilizer. It's it's pretty high nitrogen, eight percent nitrogen, four percent uh, phosphorus, two percent potassium. Uh, it's, but and, and it's pretty pretty good bang for your buck. Doctor Earth is very pricey, uh, but it's good. Uh, it's a five percent nitrogen uh, fertilizer. Um, and uh, my, my favorite of all these granular fertilizers is a product called Sustain. Uh, as you see on the right there, it's S-U-S-T-A-N-E. It's a brand name. Basically what it is is composted chicken and turkey manure with the litter. Um, and uh, the brands that are available here locally is uh, one with 8% nitrogen, one with 4% nitrogen, and, and they're good. So uh, there's another uh, company called uh, California Fertilizer, uh, and they're line is Phyta, P-H-Y-T-A, grow, and they have a citrus avocado uh, mix, and it's good too. Okay, it almost doesn't, you can use a rose fertilizer. It almost doesn't matter what you use in terms of these granular fertilizers, something with 5% nitrogen or more, and do it in splits. Um, I usually would make my first fertilization sometime when it warms up, late Feb into early March. And then as it says here, every four, six or eight weeks. In this climate, particularly if you don't get frost, you can go well into August. If you're in an area that gets frost, I would stop fertilizing in July. You don't want to uh, stimulate too much succulent nitrogenous growth because it's more frost prone uh, like that. If you do sustain frost damage, don't do anything. Don't cut it out wait until the season is ended and it's warmed up because that damaged tip wood serves as a buffer to the good wood. So leave it on there. And when you cut, you also wound the plant and open it up to uh, uh, more frost damage. So just be patient, wait like that. Um, another thing I've been doing for ages with roses, uh, rose growers recommend this, is using alfalfa meal. 
and kelp powder. Now they're very pricey and I just use a little, but they both contain really strong growth hormones that really stimulate root growth and, photo and, and enhance photosynthesis. So uh, I find them to be good. So I have a kind of a mixed package uh, and I will do this in splits as indicated here, starting sometime in late Feb, March, as the weather warms up. Uh, and I would, I used to recommend mulching all the way under the tree. I no longer recommend that. It's just too clunky when you're trying to do these multiple splits of fertilizer application. So I mulch between the trees, but not inside the drip line. Uh, so I'll come in and uh, apply compost and the fertilizer. I'll scratch it in the soil with a garden fork and then I'll water. Again, water activates nutrients. Um, and I use this combination of, these days I'm using sustain, a little kelp meal and uh, alfalfa meal. Uh, if you're having acute problems, the tree's just funky, not doing well, you can go to using liquid fertilizers. You can make a tea out of both the alfalfa and the kelp. Uh, and you also can use fish emulsion. If you're going to use fish emulsion, probably the best, and I think actually the only certified organic one these days is a brand name Alaska, and it works well. It's, it's going to be the quickest acting of fertilizers. Uh, the, uh, bulky compost is the slowest acting. Uh, pellets are next. And fine granular meals are quicker still and liquids even quicker. And if you want to, if you want to apply a foliar spray, that gets into the plant today. So that's the quickest acting of all. So the point is do something. Cup three times a year from spring through mid late summer. Okay. Next slide. Uh, watering. Uh, citrus are surprisingly, alarmingly surface rooted. If you use a mulch and you just peel the mulch away, the citrus roots will be right there within an inch or two of the surface. They're also beautiful. They're very fibrous, and, uh, very efficient feeders, um, broad ranging, uh, definitely wider than deep. And they're all this beautiful kind of orange burnt copper color, really cool. Uh, and again, the most effective feeding uh, zones are outside and inside the drip line. Uh, so watering citrus, uh, you should do it probably once a week, maybe twice a week if we're having weather like this. You should gauge down when the soil is dry, dry to the point where it doesn't ball up about four to six inches, you should apply water. Um, we use one inch of water a week in warm stretches like this, maybe two. How do you determine what one inch of water is? It's kind of simple. Whatever your applicator, if you're using a sprinkler, and you can sprinkle citrus overhead. They have a waxy leaf so they don't get disease, but it's sometimes hard to get that water to penetrate down through the tree canopy. Uh, but uh, I like micro sprinklers and, and drip tape, uh, uh, inline drip tape uh, like that. So you just take whatever it is, your sprinkler, your drip line, your micro sprinkler, you turn it on and you invert it in a bucket until you get an inch of water and however many minutes that is, that's how long it takes to put an inch on. Uh, that's pretty easy. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, citrus and tree size, as I say, I said, you know, it's a size manageable tree. Well, it can be a size manageable tree. The original citrus, uh, uh, in this state, but around the world, in Riverside uh, County, Orange County, uh, we're on what are called full size, ultimately full size standard or seedling rootstocks. They're just grafted onto seedling citrus. And that will produce a 30 foot, maybe a 30 plus foot tree. In general, when you talk about the height of citrus, assume the width is about the same with a few rare exceptions. So a 30 by 30 foot tree, and there's still some that are 150 years old down in Riverside County, and they're just glorious things, totally impractical, <laughs> but glorious like that. Sometime after the Second World War, a fellow named Floyd Dillon, who uh, uh, pioneered and developed the greatest citrus nursery in the world, Four Winds, which is now being in his fourth generation, run by his grandkids, Aaron and Lexi Dillon, down in uh, Watsonville, Corralitos area here. Uh, he discovered somehow by chance came upon the palm cirrus I mentioned earlier or the trifolia uh, leaf citrus and fooling around with it, grafting citrus varieties onto it uh, he could produce a semi-dwarf tree so you take that 30 foot Valencia orange from 
the 1870s in Riverside, California, and you graft it onto this trifoliate word, rootstock, it'll be, you know, not quite half size, but almost 12 to 18 feet, uh, something like that. And then sometime in the 70s or 80s, somewhere in the hills of Cuba, someone found a wild, uh, they thought it was a pomelo or a grapefruit. Uh, and um, it's sometimes referred to as the cute, they use it as a rootstock, it imports extreme dwarfness to citrus. So you take that 30 foot Valencia orange and it'll be maybe six foot tall, uh, eight foot tall on a dwarfing rootstock. So you have choices. In general, I would say a shoe, the full size citrus, it's, it's just not practical like that. Um, uh, on Maple Street, around the corner from the bagelry, there's a 30 foot tall grapefruit that's really wild to look at. I have no <laughs> idea how they can harvest fruit other than climb out the window or something. Uh, semi dwarfs, okay, but I just more and more recommend true dwarf, the Cuban and the Shattuck rootstock. I do that with a few exceptions. So the, you see the range here a dwarf three to eight, semi dwarf 12 to 18, full size 25 to 30. So the range is because each different variety of citrus will have some different inherent genetic vigor. So as an example, uh, the Meyer lemon is a natural dwarf. Even on full-size rootstock, it's only about six or eight feet by six or eight feet like that. The same could be said of the Owari Satsuma mandarin. Um, and uh, uh, on the other hand, lemons and pomelos uh, are crazy vigorous like that. Oranges are somewhat in between. Mandarins are more dwarf than not. That is the inherent genetic vigor. So if you put a weak variety, and I don't mean it's sickly, I just weak in terms of genetic vigor, like a Meyer lemon on a uh, truly dwarf rootstock, it'll only be three feet tall. Now, do you want that? Maybe you want to do it on a semi-dwarf, or maybe you, uh, I don't think we ever want to do anything these days on a full-size tree. But the Meyer lemon and the Owari Satsuma uh, mandarin, which is about the earliest mandarin, sometimes we get them as early as Thanksgiving, it's really sprightly light, a little sweet, not the sweetest, but such a slipskin orange, easy to peel, kids love it. Uh, it's, it's very dwarf. I like it on a semi-dwarf rootstock. So, so think about your rootstock. So mostly you don't have to think about it because mostly these days, unless it's, it says, unless you specify or it says differently, the nurses just sell dwarf rootstock, a citrus on dwarf rootstock. Okay, all that stuff uh, about, about rootstocks. Couple more things. One is they don't know why, but they know that it's true. The more dwarfing the rootstock, the more precocious the tree is. Precocity is a term that's used in fruit growing industry and research. And it means, well, much like you could say, uh, Mozart, he was a precocious young, young lad, productive at an early age. Allegedly, he wrote sonatas at age three to five. So the same thing it tries, I mean, citrus don't sing, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, a dwarf rootstock, a more dwarfing the rootstock, the earlier in the life of the tree it will start to bear and the quicker it will come to full maturation. So you can start to have fruit in two to three years on dwarf rootstock, it'll be five or six years on semi dwarf, it'll be better part of a decade or more on, on full, full size trees. So you get fruit earlier. And again, I don't know why, but it's true. If you were to do an analysis, and they have, of the volume of the tree canopy and the pounds of fruit produced, the dwarf tree outproduces the big tree. Now you're gonna have more fruit on an individual big tree than a small tree, but if you looked at it in terms of area, where you could probably get maybe a half a dozen or eight dwarf trees in the same area you would have a full-size tree, the dwarf tree will outproduce the big tree. So, uh, all that's the good news. The bad news is that, so, and, and when these dwarf citrus rootstocks came along, they thought it was gonna revolutionize the production industry. It hasn't, nobody does that. And the reason is dwarfing rootstocks tend to throw suckers. And the sucker is basically a pomelo, which is monstrous thing like this, a wild pomelo that has all, all rind and no, no fruit, no meat uh, and no juice. It has thorns like that uh, and it, 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 it has huge leaves and when you're looking at, and, and, and it will outgrow the variety and kill it in many cases. So sometimes, sometimes you planted a dwarf citrus, but I can't believe that guy said they grow slowly in the beginning. Well, look at that thing. It's too good to be true. The answer is it is. Uh, that's probably a rootstock sucker and you need to cut it out. You need to cut it out as soon as you see it. It can actually kill the tree. And they do that 
just unbidden. They do that with any kind of heat or cold stress. They do it with water stress. They just do it. It's a problem, but it's still worth it. Okay, next slide. Uh, hey, Warren, Warren, yeah. I'll give a time check. It's six o'clock. You yeah. have 80,000 questions. Okay, so well, let's wow. go faster. Hey, you can grow citrus in containers. I use a half wine barrel or a 20 gallon or bigger uh, uh, container. And I would use dwarf root stocks and I would use mandarins, uh, not true lemons, Meyer lemons. True lemons are really vigorous. Uh, uh, Calamondins, uh, kumquats, limequats, things like that. Uh, uh, as far as a potting soil for your, your containers, I recommend using part, maybe 30, 40% good garden soil, and then part um, any good potting soil you can get. But having some native soil that's good, not funky, uh, will help you to retain moisture better than not. Uh, and as it says here, dark containers dry out quickly, so you have to keep an eye on them. Uh, you need to make sure whatever the container is, it's got good drainage holes in the bottom. Let's move on. Uh, let's just scoot through uh, varieties of note. Uh, navel oranges, uh, uh, all oranges were seeded until sometime in the 1870s. I have a Valencia orange here, and maybe you can see the seeds. It has seeds. It's really sweet, but it has seeds, thus it's usually used as a juice orange. But somewhere in Bahia, Brazil, in the 1870s, there was a natural mu limb mutation of a seeded orange, and it was what we now know as the navel orange a seedless orange. And somehow they, they grafted it and somehow they sent some samples to the USDA in Washington, D.C. and they were growing them out. And there was a guy working there who knew a woman, Eliza Tibbetts, who was growing citrus, kind of pioneer woman, growing citrus in Riverside in the 1870s. He said, hey, I got these really amazing uh, seedless oranges. You want some? And she says, sure. So he shipped some out by railroad car and planted them. Uh, and there were three originally, and from that was grafted what essentially is the North American naval industry. Uh, fruit, uh, industry. Uh, and as you can see here, this is antiquated. There's a more, it's, it's still there, but downtown Riverside on the corner of Magnolia and Arlington, I've got relatives in the area, uh, there is the original native parent North American naval tree there. And it's, hundred and something years old. There were two, one died because uh, Riverside used to be the smuggest place in the world. Uh, and uh, so it's cool. Um, other, uh, actually go back to this slide. So, so navels do reasonably well here in Santa Cruz. Uh, reasonably well, great. Well, some years, yeah, some years, no. My, my favorite of all the navels is one called Skaggs Bonanza. It's early, it's big, and it's sweet. And it used to be hands down my favorite, but lately I've yeah, it turned. Uh, and Lane's Late, which is neither, which is not late at all. It starts in just about as early as the uh, uh, Skaggs Bonanza in February. And there's still some on our trees like that. It is a really sweet navel. Uh, Trovita is good if you live particularly right on the coast in foggy coastal areas. It's probably going to get you the most sugar of any navel. It's a navelless navel, but seedless. And Caracara, which is another natural mu uh, mutation from Venezuela in the 1970s, is both exquisite looking. It's kind of got a, a pink red uh, color to the flesh and super sweet. And I've got one in my backyard and sweets up just fine. Okay, next slide. Uh, blood oranges, like I said, a sinister name for such a sweet thing. Uh, anthocyanins, uh, which are antioxidants, are what cause uh, the red uh, tinging. Uh, the red tinging is variable, both external and internal. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a natural mutation, probably occurred in Italy. Uh, and there are a number of varieties. The two that do best in our area are, as mentioned here, Moro, which is pictured here. Uh, it's the darkest of them and Sanguinelli, which is just weakly colored, uh, but it's a little sweeter. And uh, I've uh, just uh, gone over, head over heels over blood oranges and just, just uh, squeeze and cut with a little ice water and Seventh Heaven. Also, it makes an excellent marmalade uh, and they, they do really well in Santa Cruz. Seeded oranges, the Valencia does pretty good here. The Valencia is a late, late, late orange. I don't even look at it before about May or June. This is off a tree 
in June and it's just starting to get real good. Um, one of the things about Valencia's, uh, and they used to grow most of the states uh, of Valencia oranges in a, in a range on the coast from uh, Oxnard, Santa Barbara down into Ventura County. And they kept them on the tree long, long as they could into the mid late summer because they got sweeter and sweeter. But they started to regreen. They developed chlorophyll in the skin and it scared customers away. So they had a whole great PR branding campaign. They called them Santa Barbara Greens and they would give out samples and they turned the corner. Now, uh, where those uh, uh, oranges were grown is mostly just housing development. So sad. Okay. Uh, I've been saying for 30 plus year, based on personal experience, don't grow grapefruits in Santa Cruz. You can't grow grapefruits in Santa Cruz. Okay, you can grow them, but they don't taste like anything. The rind is four inches thick. They don't have any juice. They don't have any, they don't do it. Well, dead wrong again in public. I have planted an Oro Blanco grapefruit, which is actually a cross between a pomelo and a grapefruit. And uh, uh, it, it, I went by it the other day, it's about three or four years old. And, oh. I just try one of these and it is so good. I'm gonna plant three or four more. Uh, and the grapefruit is a really vigorous tree. So this is one that really suits itself to a dwarf and rootstock. I have a friend who's got a, uh, owns a, a grapefruit orchard down on the shores of the Salton Sea, where it's probably about 115 today. But he goes from flowering to harvest in five or six months. In Santa Cruz, these oral blancos are on the tree for about 18 to 20 months. Harvest, so it's long and slow, but you can grow a blanco and it's pretty darn good fruit. Next, mandarins, mandarins, mandarins. Is there anything bad to say about mandarins? No, they're all great, and there's so many of them. Well, there's one bad thing to say about mandarins they are extremely alternate bearing. I have an encore mandarin in my driveway, actually, two or three of them, uh, that literally had 300 fruit on it last year and literally has no fruit this year. This is severe alternate bearing. Heavy year, light year. Uh, and it's just genetics of the uh, Mandarin trying to breed it out of it. They can't do it. Uh, and not all Mandarins do well on the coast here. Here are some that do. The Oari Satsuma, as I said, it's, it's the earliest in Feb. Uh, it starts in November, runs through Feb. Doesn't hold on the tree that well, but it's followed quickly by what is called alternately the Clementine and the, or Algerian. And the Clementine, and uh, with another variety that's a little later, the Mercot comprised the brand Cuties, which is just one of the greatest marketing gimmicks ever because they're genetically small fruit. And people would always say, what's up with that? And then when they're Cuties in bag, people can't get enough of them. Um, the Mineola Tangelo is uh, one of my favorite. It's a cross, as I said, between a mandarin and a grapefruit. It's mostly mandarin-like in its texture and the sectioning, but it's got some kind of a aftertaste that's just heavenly. It's undescribable, so I won't try to describe it. Um, something that you will never get in the store, but you ought to put in your backyard is a variety of mandarin called Encore, and it's the only summer ripening mandarin I know of. I don't even look at it before about the 1st of July and it fruits well into the fall. Uh, and it's uh, got a sugar content that's insane. Now it's got a couple of drawbacks. Uh, one is it's not real pretty. It's got these blotches and spots on it. Hey, just peel it and eat it. Uh, and the other is, as I said, it's extremely alternate bearing. But boy, on the on years, you get them right. Um, gold nugget is gnarly looking thing, but really slip skin, easy to peel, sections well, and super sweet. Again, not all mandarins are sweet on the coast. The gold nugget does well here. Next slide. Uh, Shasta gold, is, Shasta gold, Yosemite gold, they're very similar, they're good. Uh, Kino and Caro. One is excellent and one is so so. Okay. Uh, so I planted two about 20 years ago. Lost the labels. So I don't know which one is great and which one is only good. Sorry. But the good one is really good. So uh, <laughs> Kara and Kara, I'm sorry, Kara and Kino. I mean, the, the okay one is, is still okay, but the good one is like, whew, like that. Mediterranean, uh, uh, Pixie and Mediterranean are good. They're small, they're small by their genetics. Uh, Paige is pretty good. Uh, Tango is another one of those new UC Riverside things that's just sweet as all get out. Uh, okay, next. 
Um, as I said, you can't really grow limes here. Don't try to grow the true lime. Uh, uh, you can grow lemons here. In fact, lemons grow best in cooler areas. Uh, sometimes like if they try to grow lemons in Florida, they get sweet. And that's not what you're really looking for in a lemon. Uh, they grow great on the coast here. Uh, there are two principal production varieties, Eureka and Lisbon, and the fruit is identical, but the trees are way different. The Lisbon is a huge, tall tree with big thorns, but a nice round, mounded shrub tree. The Eureka is a, a gawky kind of thing, you can't decide which way it's going, this and that, uh, but more dwarf and uh, no thorns. It's really good. Uh, the Meyer lemon, again, not a true lemon. And some, I don't like Meyer lemons. I think Stephanie and I, my wife, are the only people of the seven billion plus people on the planet that don't <laughs> like Meyers, but they're highly productive. Lemons and Meyer, true lemons and Meyer lemons are ever, ever bearing. They almost always have some fruit on them throughout the year. It's hard to beat that. Uh, Meyer lemons are great in cooking. I just don't like Limes, now you can't grow a real lime, but there are a number of substitutes. The two principal ones I have listed here are the beer slime, which actually turns yellow, as does the green bartender's lime. I have two, again, I'm gonna say, the last few fruit on the tree this year, uh, beer slimes here. And one time, I, it's beers, as it's spelled here, B-E-A-R-S-S, -S, named after a guy in Porterville who uh, uh, found it as a mutation. And, cloned it, uh, grafted it. Uh, one time I was saying beer slime to some students and they thought I was saying beer, B-E-R, slime. So I <laughs> slime is what it is. And the Rangpur lime, which is uh, give you lime-like substance out in the outer sunset district and foggiest place you've ever been. Uh, and it's uh, kind of a puffy little mandarin that uh, peels easy in sections like a mandarin. Uh, but has a distinctively lime-like taste. Wow, that's good. Wish you were here. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, kumquats you can grow here marginally. So you can grow them here, they fruit marginally. So they're okay. But some of the kumquat hybrids, is, uh, particularly uh, lime quats and the Tavares, uh, is really a good lime substitute for this kind. The orange. My orange quad is also very good and it's got that kind of reverse, the, the quads have the reverse flavor thing going for them. The skin is a little sweeter and the flesh is more acid. Uh, and the lime quad tastes like limes and the orange quad tastes like oranges. So Calamondins, as mentioned, uh, I'm just wild about them. Uh, last thing here is citrus hystrix or the Macrute lime. And you see it on the right here. Um, it produces this gnarly little fruit. Sometimes the zest is used, but it's just really, it's almost like car paint dinner or something. It's really phenolic. Uh, but it has this cool piggyback leaf here. And it's kind of de rigueur in any type of uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, cooking, stir fries or clear broth soup. And it's just a marvelous thing. It goes by the brand uh, labeled in the nurseries, also a kaffir line. And it's a term that I don't like to use. It's from Arabic, it means infidel or unbeliever, but it was used during the apartheid years in South Africa as a racial uh, slur. So, and, and I actually am happy, I was talking with Four Winds and I they dropped the kaffir lime label on the plants here. So Makrut is a, a Thai, Thai word, and I don't know what it means, uh, but I just, it's a little bit of a, tongue twister, but I just call it citrus hystrix, say that fast five times. A really uh, kind of calmer tree, natural dwarf, uh, producing tons of leaves uh, and uh, using fresh or dried and I, it does really well here. I recommend it, so. Okay. Okay, we got some questions. Um, let's kind of go to the kind of high level questions. Oh, questions. Hi. There have been some questions about fruit drop. Fruit drop. Very small and the fruit falls off. Any idea why? Uh, all right, restate the question, fruit drop. Fruit drop, a little fruit. Right. As I mentioned in the beginning of the season, when the fruit is small, it just naturally thins and drops, but that's different than, you know, if you have large fruit. But let me just say that last year with the wildfires, uh, 
all manner of fruit dropped like crazy for a number of months during that time period into the fall. Citrus, citrus apples, pears just falling off the tree. So I, I attribute to something about wildfire stress like that. Um, reasons uh, citrus would drop. Some varieties just do that. They don't hold on the tree very, very long. The beer slime, as much as I like it, it just drops like crazy uh, uh, like that. So uh, it might be a varietal characteristic. Um, certainly any type of stress, particularly water stress will cause a tree, trees just regulating, just dumping stuff. So it's gonna drop fruit like that. Um, that would be my answer or answers. Okay. How about oranges with, that are not sweet and they have a really thick skin? What causes that? Uh, well, uh, could be a couple of things. There are sour oranges, the Seville orange, which are used primarily for marmalade. But if you know you've got a reputable nursery and you've got a, a, a Valencia or a Navel or a Trovita or a Caracara um, and it's sour, uh, it's probably got to do with lack of water. Uh, you know, right when citrus is enlarging and starting to color, the juice sacs are then forming and enlarging and you've got to pulse water there to get uh, quality taste. Okay, we had a number of people who, um, who have a very large tree and you say no pruning, but they want to know how they can control the size. Right. Uh, uh. Okay, let's wait in, wait in the water as it were, uh, tiptoe in. Um, this could kill it or cure it. I just urge caution. Making a number of wounds on a tree with diameter of two inches or more could be lethal. But what I would do is look at the tree and you don't want to cut back or head back branches. You want to thin out entire branches. So just look at, it, it would be helpful if I had a picture and you can send me one and be how big is this tree. But let's say it's 15 feet tall. Just take a look at that tree and are, are there branches that are lower down and less vigorous? And can you eliminate or thin? Again, don't stub back. If you stub back, the tree will go crazy and grow taller but branches that you can thin. Do a couple a year. That's what I would recommend. Uh, the other thing is you could turn around and find a place to plant a dwarf. There you go. Um, what cover crops do you recommend around citrus? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't uh, get into, I don't do cover crops under citrus like I do with the citrus trees because they're evergreen, you can't. Uh, but I will sometimes do them in the alleys or in between the trees in the rows. And uh, I, I more and more am not doing cover crop. I feel a little sheepish, but it's the truth. <laughs> I don't do cover crops in the citrus anymore. Um, fall sown uh, cover crops, the bell, bell beans, vetch and grasses, uh, get too tall, especially on dwarf and semi-dwarf trees. And when you need to access the tree in the middle of winter into spring is when the cover crop is the biggest and the thickest and it just doesn't work out. So I fertilize, I, as I say, I mulch with wood chips between the trees and under the tree, I keep the ground bare and so I can apply my multiple splits of fertilizer compost and fertilizer. There were a couple of questions um, that talked about stress after transplanting from a pot to the ground. What's yeah. the right time of year and what? Yeah, I, I didn't mention I'm remiss in that and so many other things, I suppose. But um, uh, as early as you can, let's say late Feb into early March is usually heralds it's warming up and you know, it's going to be all right. And you want to get citrus in the ground as soon as you can to take advantage of that whole first year. The sooner you can, the better. Um, and you plant them, they're evergreen. And so you plant them from containers. Generally, you wanna plant a five gallon container or bigger. And a five gallon container costs you about 40 bucks probably. Uh, and if you go up to like 15 or 20 gallon container, it's a, it's a much bigger tree. And it's gonna cost you maybe 120, 150 bucks, but it might be worth it to you uh, because you're, you're down the road about three years already. You might even have a crop the second year. Um, but when you plant, you have to be very careful. Like today would not be a good day to do anything outdoors, basically, other than maybe jump in the ocean shortly. Um, uh, 
So uh, when you're planting, prepare the hole, open the hole. Uh, it should be a little wider and a little deeper than the roots in the pot. And then uh, it's a two person operation. One person holds the trunk of the tree by the, sh the shank and just kind of pounds a little bit lightly uh, around the edges of the rim of the pot. And hopefully the pot will drop away. You scoot out of the way and you quickly usher the tree with as little root disturbance as you can. And this is facilitated if you pre really soak the root ball down before you transplant. Anyhow, you bonk the pot, get it in a hole and your buddy buries it, as they say in the industry. Don't really bury the tree, just covers it up like that. And then you puddle up and water in right away. Do it in the, it's another reason for doing it early in the season when it's not so hot. Do it in a cool part of the day or during a gray wet stretch or a foggy stretch and water in ASAP. Um, okay, let's see what else. Can you propagate from cuttings? Hmm, yes and no. Um, uh, most citrus doesn't take from cuttings, but there are some notable exceptions. Uh, the beer slime, the Meyer lemon uh, does, a uh, Rangpur lime. Uh, let me just urge you to be very careful. There's a disease called citrus screening, uh, which is spread by a little insect, flying insect. Um, and you want to be careful about moving any kind of propagation material from one even one property to another uh, like that. But if you want to do your own, uh, the citrus hystrix, uh, the Meyer lemon, uh, real lemons uh, do too, but they, it, it undoes the dwarfness of the root stock, so you're going to get a 25 foot lemon tree. Um, uh, but most citrus just doesn't take from cuttings, would that they did. And um, <clears throat> someone has a mandarin with very, very dense leaf cover. And she's wondering if uh, thinning the leaves would help it ripen faster. Okay, what was the original first part of it? I didn't know with very thin. So it's a mandarin with very dense leaf cover, which is most mandarins to my lights. But yeah, and citrus. Citrus is different than deciduous fruit. It actually, because of its tropical origin, it can ripen in the shade and dense of the canopy. I would not remove the leaves. Uh, you're, uh, you, you could set the fruit up for sunscreen. And then Lee, citrus stores almost all its reserve, uh, re reserves, its nutrients and carbohydrates in its leaves. So um, to get them right there and to shuttle them to the fruit is critical as the fruit sizes. Whereas deciduous trees store most of their reserves in their roots. Uh, so I, I wouldn't remove these. Okay. So we had a person who had a five-year-old orange tree that was only three feet tall and it finally gave some oranges this year. Um, why is it so short? And is it a slow go grower? Are oranges slow growing? Oranges aren't, well, let me just say, all citrus out of the shoot, out of the gate, at planting is slow for a year, two, maybe three. So you want to push it with water and fertility. Um, be really on your game, as it were. Um, and, uh, but it's, how old was it? Five years old? Yeah, five. Uh, <clears throat> something rotten in Denmark here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but this tree is really at, at, on a dwarf rootstock. You should have a fully established tree that's at least four, five, six feet by four or five feet, uh, and, and be in full production in year five or six. So, um, what's the soil like? What's your care like? Uh, is there any injury to the bark? Let me all just also just say, be careful about watering citrus um, and getting water uh, up against the bark. The citrus bark is really sensitive to any type of injury or water molds uh, like that. Um, so, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, a lot of times people ask me, ask me, hey, can you come out and look at my fruit tree? It's eight years old. My apple tree is eight years old. And I say, okay, where's the tree? And they start looking down. Well, I guess I um, so I would say, you know, try to be remedial. Try to be on top of your watering and fertility game. But if it ain't happening, it ain't happening. Plan a new one. Uh, and try to try to figure out what went wrong. I'm sorry I can't diagnose it better here from my kitchen counter, uh, but and try to try to mix it up a little bit. See, be be on top of your game. Uh, sometimes you do get weak specimens, that's true. Right, from nurseries, lamentably so. Okay. Okay. Let's take one more. Um, we had a question about 
someone who apparently the scion on the rootstock died and the rootstock has been growing. Yeah. So they have a large, vigorous tree, but it's not bearing any fruit. What would you, what the do. question is, can you, can you, um, uh, what's the word, graft onto that? Yeah, you can. Uh, it's a pretty delicate operation uh, for the lay people like ourselves under outdoor conditions. The success rate is rather low, but you could try it. Uh, you should get hold of the rare fruit growers. They could probably uh, come over and counsel you. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that happens. The rootstocks on those dwarf, root so uh, dwarf trees outgrow the sign. And uh, uh, so I would just replace it. All right. I am going to put into the chat a link. This is um, to help us improve. It's your feedback on the class and what we can do better and what we did well. And I just want to thank folks for uh, hanging in there. I've been giving these things for, I don't know how long, nine, 10, 11 months like that. And it's really hard to teach gardening from my kitchen. <laughs> but I, I, just doing great. I, I appreciate people's interest and I hope this can be a springboard for you getting out and doing it in the yard, but also for coming up to the farm and garden as we open up and have workshops. And uh, we believe in that apprenticeship style of learning. You learn side by side by working with others that know a little more than you do. So come on up. Okay. And that's a perfect segue. Thank you, Warren. These are classes that are coming up, workshops. Um, we've been doing a winter squash grow along. And this is a, a group event where we have planted squashes and we are getting together um, once every one to two months to see how they're going and talk about the different phases of the growth. It's kind of an experiment. If you haven't been part of it, you are welcome to participate and you can watch the previous recordings on YouTube. So that's coming up in July. Can I, can I jump in here? Which is to say, uh, boy, if you could really uh, uh, send some questions to us in advance, it would help structure the next uh, session. The questions and even photos, like how, really how photos. long is yours? <laughs> I will be sending out a reminder to everybody who's been on any one of the other two classes um, to help get that started. Botanical baking coming up in July. That's going to be fun with decorating and infusing flavors into, into baked goods. And one of our board members is teaching that. And then we're going to get into what we're calling hybrid classes because we're hoping the university will open up more. So sketching in the garden, there will be a virtual like one hour component of that uh, talking about technique and then hopefully we'll be able to get access to the garden and get in and actually do some sketching in the garden with um, an instructor to guide that. Um, August 31st, seed saving and seed sovereignty. Seeds are very important to the universe in the world. And um, this is a wonderful class. We've taught it a few times and it's always a big hit. So that is also going to be virtual with a potential seed exchange afterwards. Um, and the exchange has not been scheduled, but you know, there will be, since you are on this class, you will get email about these other classes um, coming your way if you don't reject the emails. And then a really fun thing is uh, 10 medicinal grow, herbs to grow in Santa Cruz County. That's being taught by herbalist. Her name just flew out of my mind, Paula Granger. Uh, she's kind of famous. So um, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. And there's more coming. And basically what CASFIS does, uh, we can't do without the support of donors and um, foundations and Gosh, 60% of our income uh, comes from donations. So if you have the ability to participate in that, either by becoming a member or making a donation at the link I just put in, um, we'd really appreciate it. And then you're gonna get this slide deck, you're gonna get the video uh, recording, and there are lots of great resources in the, the deck, as well as um, recommended text. Oren has a book. On There's a chapter on citrus in it as well. It has a chapter on citrus. It's not all about citrus, but it's certainly a useful and informative book and gets into a deeper dive. 
And with that, I think we'll we'll say good night and Oren can go jump in the ocean. All right. And then I gotta catch the giant skein a little. Oh, the giant skein. Thanks, folks. Thanks Bye. for having me. See ya. Thank you all for being here.